Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to learn about the 2004 movie simply called King Arthur. As you can guess from the title, the movie is all about the legendary Arthur, and we do see all the names that we're familiar with, Guinevere, Lancelot, Gawain, Galahad, Merlin, and so on. But one thing that makes the 2004 version of King Arthur a little different is it was marketed as being more historically accurate, a more historically accurate adaptation of the story. For example, King Arthur in the movie isn't a king throughout most of the film. He's a Samaritan knight whose time in the Roman army is almost up. But first, he must complete one final mission from Bishop Germanus, go north of Hadrian's Wall and rescue an important Roman family before the invading Saxons get there. To help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, I am super excited to be joined by Professor Dorsey Armstrong. Professor Armstrong is a medievalist who has a long list of credits. She's a professor of English and medieval literature at Purdue University, editor-in-chief of Arthuriana, the journal for Arthurian studies. She's published numerous books, including a translation of Sir Thomas Mallory's classic, Le Mort d'Arthur. But on a personal note, it was the story of King Arthur that got me interested in history as a child, and I've been a fan of her work ever since I heard her lecture series from the great courses called King Arthur, History and Legend back in 2009. So I'm super excited to finally get to chat with Professor Armstrong today. Before we bring her on the line, though, it's time to set up our game, Two Truth and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one. One of them is an all-out lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, early legends place Excalibur as coming from the Lady of the Lake. Number two, Lancelot was always associated with with Arthurian legend. Number three, some suggest Arthur married multiple women named Guinevere. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to identify which one of those is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to connect with Professor Armstrong about the historical accuracy of King Arthur. If you were to take a step back and overall look at the 2004 King Arthur movie to give it a letter grade for its historical accuracy, what would it get? As far as a letter grade for its historical accuracy, I think that you would have to break it into sections and some parts would get an A and many parts would get an F. And so we'll, <laughs> That's quite, a, quite a gap. So yes, it, it's... <laughs> There are moments that are so carefully, scrupulously paying attention to what would have been going on in the fifth century and what we know about early chronicle accounts of who King Arthur was is that pay attention to details. And then others, there are other moments where they've just thrown everything out the window and they've um, you know, done something kind of crazy with the story. And so, <laughs> but I will say this. What is great about this film, the further away I get from it in time, the more I like it. Because despite what it gets wrong, it gets the idea of Arthur right. So even if it's okay. not an accurate historical representation of King Arthur, the character who is noble, good, beloved by his men, willing to sacrifice himself, all of those are the elements that we find in the Arthurian legend that have made it so popular. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and we'll, we'll uh, chat about some of those a uh, little more specifically later on, but I wanted to quote something from the beginning of the movie because it starts off kind of setting some, uh, setting the scene almost. It, a quote from the movie, it says, historians agree that the classical 15th century tale of King Arthur and his knights rose from a real hero who lived a thousand years earlier in a period often called the Dark Ages. Recently discovered archaeological evidence sheds lights on his true identity. So as a historian, do you agree with that opening statement? Again, it's like my grade that I gave the movie. Parts, parts <laughs> of it get an A, 
part of it get an F. So, yes, absolutely. The 15th century hero that we know probably has his origins in a real person, possibly persons, who lived during the 5th century. And I will say as much as medievalists um, hate the phrase dark ages, if there ever was a dark age, 5th century Britain after the Romans have withdrawn, is it? It it really does Mm. count as a dark age. So that part is true. The idea that recent archaeological discoveries have located the Arthurian legend in the north, that's a little less plausible. I will say that every time a 5th century or thereabouts archaeological discovery is made, uh, no matter where it is in the British Isles, people attempt to connect it to King Arthur or the Arthur-type figure on which he was based. But generally speaking, as far as the legend goes, most of Arthur's exploits and tales and stories and legends are focused much more towards the South and the Southwest. Okay, of course, keeping in mind the movie came out in 2004, it talks about recently discovered archaeological evidence. The impression I get is that there was something that kind of broke open. Oh, this is who, who it is. Was there any some sort of discovery I, like that? What I believe what happened in the years before that is that up near Hadrian's Wall, there had been some archaeological discoveries um, that indicated that a local leader had remained in power and had consolidated a base of power there after the Romans had withdrawn. But you can say the same about other parts of Britain as well. There are (laughs) there are several people, understandably, who try to step into that vacuum of power. And we don't know much about them, which is why almost every one of them could be considered a candidate for the historical Arthur or, as I like to call him, an Arthur type figure. Arthur type figure. Okay. I like that. (laughs) Something else we get kind of at the opening of the movie is an explanation of how one of the other characters, Lancelot, joined Arthur. According to the movie in 300 AD, the Romans were expanding their empire to the east where the Sarmatians live. The Romans defeated them, but they were so impressed by the bravery of the cavalry that they let them live in exchange for each generation of Sarmatian boys joining the Roman military as knights for 15 years. And then fast forward to 452 AD, we see a young Lancelot being taken from his home to join the Roman military. He's stationed under Arthur in Britain to defend what you just mentioned, uh, Hadrian's Wall, as as the movie describes it, a 73-mile wall that's separating the native fighters in the north with the Roman-controlled Britain to the south. Then, of course, the movie fast forwards 15 years to 467 AD. That's kind of the timeline for the rest of the movie. But setting all that up, does the movie do a pretty good job of setting the timeline? So that's an interesting question, because on the one hand, yes, wherever the Romans went, they did tend to try and co-opt or bring into the empire or I'll just say it, exploit peoples who had skills that they thought were valuable and especially useful in fighting. And it is true that at one point, very early on, that included the Sarmatians to the east. But what's really interesting about this film is that the Sarmatian theory, as far as King Arthur goes, is a theory uh, put forward by Linda Malcor and C. Scott Littleton. And they wrote a book called From Scythia to Camelot. And in that book, they posit that there was no historical Arthur figure, that what happened is the Sarmatians are conscripted into the Roman army, which, which we know happened. They ended up in Britain. So that also did happen. But then their theory is that they're there in the second century serving under a Roman leader named Lucius Artorius Castus. And that it is a mix of Sarmatian mythology with the reputation and the idealized figure of this leader that centuries later would get mushed together to create Arthur and many of the legends uh, that are associated with him. So it's interesting that the movie says this is true, whereas the book argues that what a study of the Sarmatian question proves is that there was no Arthur and that he wasn't a real person who lived in the fifth century. And so it puts those two things together in sort of uncomfortable juxtaposition. It makes for a good film. 
Absolutely. So par- it is partially true that there were Sarmatians. They were incorporated into the empire. They did make it all the way to Britain, most likely. And they did serve in the second century under someone named Lucius Artorius Castus, where we get that Arthur name in his middle name. I'm, I'm sensing a trend that there's going to be some A and F. There's like not much, I'm sensing a trend here. between. So I, w- I will say this again, the further away uh, I get from the original screen of that film, the more I like it and the more I like what it does in how it encapsulates the essence of why Arthur has become such an important figure for 1500 years. One of the other characters that we see in the movie is Merlin, and the way the movie kind of explains him, he's a he's a woad leader. The first interaction that he has with Arthur's soldiers is a fight against them, and he's not the wizard of the legends that we you know we've we've heard. Although there is a line of dialogue that caught my ear that I think it's Lancelot describing Merlin as a quote unquote dark magician. Can you fill in a little more historical context around what we know about Merlin? So this is a really interesting question because the Merlin character does not get associated with the Arthurian legend uh, until the 12th century when a guy called Geoffrey of Monmouth takes what he knows about one or possibly two figures upon which he bases his Merlin and decides to put it together with the Arthurian legend. Now, we do think that there are possibly two historical figures upon which this Merlin figure is based. One is Merlin Caledonius, who was a warrior who went mad and lived in the woods. And the other is Merlin Ambrosius, who in some of the texts fought by Arthur's side early on and had skills, maybe not necessarily of magic, but he was a great builder, a great engineer. And so what he did kind of looked like magic. And it Mm. appears that Geoffrey of Monmouth, writing around 1136 or so, puts what he knows of this Welsh bard slash warrior wandering through the forest and creates a Merlin character and then moves that Merlin character into the Arthurian legend. So before the 12th century, Merlin is not a wizard who's in any way associated with King Arthur and his story, which bums my students out so much every time I I tell them that because they really (laughs) want to believe that at least these two figures are, are true. And I say, you know what? They're both probably fifth or sixth century. So they're, they both exist at the right time, but we don't see them together until the 12th. Well, I guess it kind of what you're saying there, everybody kind of wants them together. So if you have a movie about King Arthur, you got to have Merlin in there too. So I could, maybe that's why they uh, throw him in there. What I would say is that anyone who's trying to make an historical King Arthur movie is going to run into the huge problem of audience ec- expectations. If you hear Arthur, you're going to expect that there there better be a Merlin. There better be a Lancelot. And as far as we know, Lancelot seems to appear fully formed in the 12th century. He's not oh. there in the original 5th century. If you're going to have an historical Arthur film set in the 5th century, you can have an Arthur. You can have a Guinevere. You can have a Bedivere. A K. And an early version of Sir Gawain, Gwalkmai. But that's it. You can't have a Lancelot. You can't have a Bors. You can't have a Galahad. You can't have Merlin. So you can imagine that if you're trying to tell the historical story of Arthur in the fifth century and people come to see this film, if there's not a Lancelot, I think people are going to be very upset. So I sympathize with all movie makers who are trying to wrestle with that question because it's a hard one. Because for Hundreds of years now, we have come to associate figures like Merlin and Lancelot with King Arthur to such an extent that they're really inextricable from each other right now. And you would disappoint your audience if you didn't have them in the movie. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> what about the, so the impression that I get, um, Merlin is the, the woad leader and the impression that I get that the woads are like a, a nomadic people who are fighting against the Roman occupation of Britain. Were they really doing that at that time? So. The Wodes are based on uh, a real people uh, called the Picts, P-I-C-T-S, and their name comes from Picti, which means painted because they did paint themselves blue before they went into battle, and the dye that they used is called Wode. And so I think that's where the movie gets that word. Uh, The reason that Hadrian's Wall 
is built in the first place is because there are some really scary blue people up beyond it. And the Romans have said, no, thank you. South of here is good. We're not going to mess with that up there at all. And so (laughs) another way that the movie stumbles is that if they're so scary that there's a wall keeping them out of the South, why is there a Roman senator living in his lovely summer estate north of the wall in the most dangerous (laughs) territory in Britain (laughs) at the time? That is a really good point they don't even talk about in the movie. <laughs> what is he doing up there? <laughs> Just a the summer home, right? right? Yeah. Apparently. Another legend that we see in the movie that um, is the round table. And according to the way we see it introduced in the film, um, we, of course, we talked about Lancelot and you mentioned Gawain and there's Galahad and Tristan and all, all of these other knights. And then there's a, a scene where uh, Bishop Germanus comes in and he has to sit at the head of the table and they're like, Oh, you can sit wherever you want. And then he comes in, it's a round table. So there is no head of the table. Do we know if the round table was an actual thing? So it is when the legend starts to pick up in the 12th century. But again, as you may have noticed, there's a theme here. A lot of what we think of as the foundational elements show up in the 12th century. Now that does not mean that they weren't present perhaps in some form in earlier texts or stories that have been lost. Uh, It is just that we only have evidence for their existence in the 12th century. What's interesting is um, that this idea comes from somewhere, and that's pretty early in the legend, this idea that Arthur, it's, it's a 12th century writer named Wass who says, Arthur sat at a table. He was first among equals, but there was a round table, so no one was above anyone else. And that's a remarkable idea for the 12th century. So I would like to imagine um, that there might be some basis or it might be an ancient memory of when this Arthur type figure gathered with his war band, because that's what they would have been. They weren't knights in the fifth century. They would have been his his war band that they gathered in uh, a circle to discuss. And so it really it could have an origin there that they're gathered around a fire or a hearth. Um, but as far as a physical table, we, we don't have any evidence of that for sure before the 12th century. What about the concept that like you were talking about with, because the, the concept of the, the round table is, yeah, there's nobody's above anybody else. And so the idea that I get is Arthur sees everybody as equals. Did, did he have that kind of concept of, you know, everybody is equals? So in the fifth century, That's a really hard question to answer if we're talking about (laughs) sub-Roman Britain. And the historical Arthur figure would have been, as far as we can tell, if he existed, I think someone who was the basis for this figure who had a name similar to Arthur did exist. He might not have been all on board with the idea of equality, but whoever this person was, based on archaeological evidence that shows a... Celtic war band led by a leader in the right time and the right place for the historical Arthur. This person must have been an amazing warrior. He must have been charismatic and he must have just been a really good guy, given how clear it is that in the wake of Rome pulling out, he was able to rally to his side something like a community of over 700 people. It's estimated when the average war band at that time, and so say the historians who know such things, would have been more like 35 people. So he must have been a great leader, a great warrior, a good ruler, a just person. And I imagine that if you're going to achieve that measure of success and maintain that level of leadership when the rest of the world is in chaos, that making people feel as if they are valued, even if it's not actually that they're being treated as equal with you would have been important. So I think that there's a little bit of truth hiding in there. That makes sense. One of the, one of the concepts that we see when that meeting with the Bishop is uh, we find out all the Knights are following the faith of their forefathers. In other words, not pagans and not They are pagans and not, and not Christians as the Romans are, but they're still fighting for Rome and the church. Was there really a tie between Arthur and the Roman church? Like the movie very heavily implies. So probably, um, most certainly since the Romans had firmly conquered most of what we think of as Britain or England today by the middle of the first century, 
and they were in power there until 410. So as the empire went, so went all of the outposts within the empire. So when the emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, all Roman citizens would have been expected to do the same. And so by the time we get to Arthur's lifetime, Rome had been Christianized for well over a century. And so we think that that's the case. Um, He certainly would have been a Christian. As far as the tolerance for other faiths, it's doubtful. It is is doubtful that as a Christian leader, anyone would have been tolerant of what they believe to be blasphemy or anathema. But at the same time, we have to remember that this is the early days of Christianity. So many of its rules, its regulations, its orthodoxy, they don't exist yet. We see a great example of this. What I really liked was the use of Pelagius. And Pelagius was, for a time, he was, he was a British monk in the 6th century. So he's a little later than, than Arthur would have been. And he was ousted from the ranks of the church and declared a heretic because he believed and he preached what came to be called the Pelagian heresy, which was essentially do good works and you'll get to go to heaven. Hmm. On the face of it, that seems to make sense. But ultimately, when the church had to decide, they declared this a heresy because in the end, humans cannot earn their way into heaven by doing good. The final decision rests with God. Only God gets to decide who gets in and who doesn't. So it doesn't matter what you've done yourself during your lifetime. It's God who makes the final call. But anything that the heresy, we have to remember, only gets called a heresy because a lot of people are believing in it and following it. So for quite some time, people would have believed in the message of Pelagius and and striven to adhere to it and, and thought, I will do good works to get into heaven. And it's only when the church decides, no, we can't have this, this, this is contrary to our doctrine, that he becomes a heretic. And so the idea that Arthur is a Pelagian Christian is a great idea. I think that makes total sense and that he is so upset when he discovers that Pelagius had been executed when he returned to Rome also makes sense. Was Pelagius then, uh, because Germanus in the movie, the the bishop that they're interacting with, we find out towards the end of the movie, he seems to kind of be the one that executed Pelagius. Was there truth to that then? That that was, okay. Yes. Uh, Yes. Pelagius was declared a heretic. Any who believed in the Pelagian heresy were um, declared heretics. You might be subject to execution or torture in all kinds of nasty ways. And we know that this is a problem for centuries afterward because it's such a popular idea that even in the 14th century, we have the church still trying to root out the Pelagian heresy uh, in all kinds of places. Because who wouldn't want to believe that if one does good, one gets rewarded? So it's an ongoing problem. You talked about this a little bit earlier, so maybe you already answered the question, but the movie does make a big deal of the final order from Rome for Arthur and his knights to go past the, the, go to the north of the wall and rescue the Roman named Marius. And then they also mentioned Marius' son, Electo, who is a, the Pope's favorite godson and pupil, as the movie explains it. They're in danger from the approaching Saxon army. Is there any truth to that kind of scenario set up with that? <laughs> this is where... I, the the history goes off the rails. Okay. Well, first of all, as I said <laughs> this earlier, is the F side of the of the rating. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the F. So first of all, there are no Romans in their luxurious villas north of Hadrian's Wall. Also, when the Saxons invade, they are not invading up there. They're invading much further south in what's England. So they wouldn't have been up there to begin with. And so the movie is is moving people around and creating a conflict. So there is a family in distress. They just create a scenario which causes them to be in distress, which is the most implausible scenario that I can think of. And then we have to add an extra enemy in the form of the Saxons, who these were the people that the historical Arthur figure did rally against, did fight against, um, seems to have stopped and pushed back in their encroachment across southern Britain from the east to the west. But they're not up north threatening Romans. That's that's not (laughs) happening at all. So 
Yes, Arthur versus the Saxons, but the geographic location is absolutely incorrect. But not not in any way the way the movie portrays it. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Something some one of the concepts in the movie um from from that as as we see him of course he's going up there to when he finally gets to Marius's estate um we can see that Marius is using his position as a Roman to subjugate the people of the town telling him he's a spokesman for God and it's a sin to defy him and then Arthur stands up against him you know Marius is not of God you're all free people from your first breath and he proceeds to try to rescue as many of the townspeople as he can, not just the Romans that he went to save. So the notion that I got was that Arthur seems to be a much more honorable person than most were at that time. Would that be a fair assessment of the kind of person that he was? I mean, I, I think, yes, he, as I said before, given the extent of what we think was his following and the number of people who flocked to his side and the length of time he was able to rule and restore peace for a couple generations, he must have been a very just person. At the same time, another area in which this film gets an F is this idea of all men are born free. Mm. No. Um, in the Middle Ages, if you went back in time to the Middle Ages and you asked anybody, would you like to be free or would you like to be beholden to this Lord? or in subject to him. The first question that anyone would ask would probably be how much land comes with either of those options? And generally speaking, everyone would usually have chosen to be not free because this society depended upon a hierarchy in which lords ruled over people, the people served their lords, and in return for that, they got the lord's protection. They were part of a social network. There was a safety net. So, for example, in times of famine, it would be expected that the lord would find a way to help his people, to keep them from starving. In times of warfare, in exchange for working his land, the lord would take everyone he could into his fortress or stronghold or castle to protect them. If you are free, and you are cut loose from this structure, um, who's going to help you? You mm. are alone in the world. How do you farm your land? Because much of farming was cooperative back then. So the villagers would come together to plant, um, to harvest. And so being all on your own, while, while it's not impossible, would not have been considered a desirable situation to be in at all. In fact, we have accounts from some parts of the Middle Ages, in which during a time of famine, people approached a particular lord and made themselves the, his slaves on purpose because in exchange they would get fed, they would be clothed, they would be housed. And this seemed to have been a temporary arrangement, but they were happy to, to give you know, their lives up into the service of the lord and be obedient to him as long as it meant protection for them and their family. So. The idea that I am a free man is absolutely incorrect as far as the Middle Ages would go. But every age, I like to say, makes an Arthur that that age needs. So in yeah. 2004, that's, that's what we wanted to hear, that it's all about freedom. It's all about individual freedom. And, and that's just, it's not the case. It's historically inaccurate. Okay, and, and even Arthur himself, like the whole reason... I mentioned you know, fi the final mission, right? Was the final mission before they were given their own freedom in, in that way. But it sounds like e maybe even that might not have been the that, case. That would not have been something they wanted. They would not yeah. have wanted. First of all, no one gets papers of safe conduct to go <laughs> through the Roman Empire in the fifth century. That's not a thing. There are not checkpoints everywhere. There aren't even enough people who can read. To, you know, to, <laughs> to tell you point. what this thing says that you're carrying that says you have the right to move throughout the Roman Empire. And so while they may have, if we're going with the Sarmatian theory, they may have wanted to go back to their homeland. They would not have wanted to be cut loose from the Roman bureaucracy. In fact, the sack of Rome, which started around 410 and then the empire sort of staggered to its final collapse around 476, the people who attacked Rome were, first of all, attacking 
not because they wanted to conquer Rome, but because they wanted to get in. Hmm. They said, yeah, give us some of that. So many of these people, these were what we think of as the Germanic peoples that lived north of Rome. Many of them had already been fighting for the Romans as mercenaries. And they saw all the benefits that Roman citizens got. And they said, well, we don't want to just be your hired hands. We, we would like roads and baths and, you know, reliable food and a functioning government. And so I doubt that many people would have wanted to move away from Rome or felt like Rome was somehow oppressive. Uh, and that's one reason why the Arthur type figure, from what we know from many of the texts, is that apparently his parents had been Romans of some rank in Britain. And then after the empire collapsed and the legions are withdrawn and called back to Rome, it is someone who has claims to Rome who can rise up and rally the people. And that's what they were looking for, some sort of vestige of what Rome had done for them. In, inter that's an interesting theory. And then it, it kind of, I guess the idea of Marius being the one that is uh, oppressive to his people, then may maybe, I mean, I'm sure there were some, some leaders that were, but it seems like maybe that dynamic would have been very different if, I mean, it's beneficial to, to the Lords then to have them do well. <laughs> you, you are exactly correct. So I have no doubt that they're um, and history shows us that there were some terrible lords and that especially in the 14th century, much later, when there's a population crisis and there's no more land to be worked and the lords are trying, in this case, trying to oppress the people to keep them on their land, to keep them beholden to them. Uh, we have the Peasants' Revolt in England in 1381. And Part of this is because after the Black Death, the first wave of the Black Death swept through and killed up to half of the European population, what had been a land crunch suddenly became a land free for all. And so there was plenty of land for the taking. So people didn't need to remain on their particular plot of land. They weren't so bounded by tradition uh, and history because the world had changed overnight, practically. But up until that point, yes, for, for most, it would be considered a, mutual, a mutually beneficial situation. If we go back to the movie, there's another character, uh, Guinevere, and we see her at the village where Marius is at. Um, she's actually a prisoner. They, there's, they're, quote unquote, sinners, and they must be sacrificed, according to the movie. Um, there are two prisoners alive there that Arthur and his men save. One is a little boy, and then Guinevere, who in the movie is a woad woman. Is there any truth to that? And kind of how, well, I'm, I'm assuming based on the, the estate not being there, that's probably not how they actually met. But um, do we know how they met or if they even did? So a lot of that is really, really lost in the mists of time. But there have been some suggestions that certainly the Arthur Guinevere marriage uh, would have been at that point politically motivated even if there, there was affection at the same time. And there seems to be a situation that suggests that he married more than one woman named Guinevere. That was a very popular name. It's the early version of Jennifer. Oh, okay. So, and Guinevere in some instances appears to possibly have come from north of where Arthur was. So closer to Scotland, Probably Northern Wales. She has a, a Welsh name. But as far as her being a pagan who lives north of the wall and is a Pict, probably not. Okay. Well, then I'm guessing the movie, then the connection in the film is Guinevere kind of becomes the connection between Arthur and Merlin, the, the woad leader. And that's kind of how that whole thing happens. Is there any sort of connection then between Guinevere, Arthur, and Merlin in the historical record? No, th there is not. But I think we can safely say that whomever the Arthur type figure married, that would have been a marriage that brought together peoples, united them, and created, you know, a larger network of support against the invading Saxons. So I think it would be safe to assume that. 
Okay. Uh, mentioning the Saxons there in the, the movie, the first confrontation that we see with Arthur and his knights and the advancing Saxon army takes place on this ice covered lake. There's Arthur and his knights. They're okay. We're not going to run anymore. We're tired of running. Uh, we're going to stay behind the rest of the people. They're trying to rescue can, can get a head start as you know, we hold off the Saxons and the movie says it's seven knights against 200. Well, eight because Guinevere joins in the fight, right? Uh, eight people against 200 Saxons. And there's this battle. And of course, you know, the arrows and people breaking the ice and falling into the ice and everything. Is there any sort of historical truth to this fight on the lake that we see in the movie? No. And in fact, that fight scene owes a lot to an earlier medieval film called Alexander Nevsky, uh, which had a very similar scene. And I actually wasn't aware of that film until after I saw the King Arthur film and I was commenting to someone about how much I enjoyed that fight scene and how clever it was. And people who know medieval film better than I do said, oh, no, that that's lifted straight from Alexander Nevsky, that fight scene. And so then I I went and checked. And yes, indeed, uh, it's still a great scene. But no, there there's no historical basis for that. OK, <laughs> Except for in the sense that another movie did it before this one. What we were talking kind of about the the person that Arthur was. And in that fight scene, we see him being willing to sacrifice himself for one of his men, uh, Dagonet, when he, he rushes out, you know, to break the ice under the Saxons. Um, and then Arthur runs out himself to help pull the injured knight away from the icy waters. Do we know if he would have sacrificed himself for his men like the movie obviously very heavily implies here? We can only surmise but again, my guess would be anyone who was able to arouse so much loyalty from his people must have been someone who made clear that he was willing to fight and die alongside his men. And that is another thing the movie does get right, is that in the Middle Ages, kings and leaders are not like modern day generals who are back looking at maps and plotting strategy. Um, you're right there at the front lines with your men. Otherwise, they wouldn't have considered you a leader worth following. OK, well, in that way, yeah, we do. We definitely do see him right there. With yes. His men, that's for sure. Yeah. At the very end of the movie, after being freed, Guinevere convinces Arthur that these are his people. So Arthur decides to stay and fight the main force of Saxons. After initially leaving with the Romans, then the rest of the knights come back and decide to stay and fight with their leader. So that's how we end up having this big battle at the ends between Arthur and his knights alongside Guinevere and Merlin's woad army against the full Saxon army. And the movie calls this the Battle of Baden Hill. Was that a real battle? And did the movie do a good job of showing how it happened? The Battle of Baden Hill comes from a ninth century chronicle in, and we do believe it was a real fight. But at the same time, it wouldn't have been at Hadrian's Wall. People have been trying to find Baden for a while. Um, okay. And we think it's in the south of of Britain, somewhere in the south. And this supposedly was one of the key battles in which Arthur, the leader, pushed the Saxons back. But also the same text tells us that there were 12 battles. And he's victorious at this one in the final battle, which is at Camlan. And no one can find Camlan exactly. There have been lots of theories, people trying to pinpoint it. That is where he is finally killed and defeated at the end. But okay. um, as far as the Arthurian legend goes, the Battle of Mount Baden, yes, was attested very, very early on in the Chronicles. Now, uh, where it was exactly, not so clear. <laughs> but, it, but it does show up. So naming that final battle after the battle in the Chronicles makes sense. Okay. Would it been in the... At the very in the movie, in in that version of the battle, at least we do see some of Arthur's men die. Tristan and Lancelot die in, in the battle, um, and so they're down to just just four knights. But then, of course, you know, there's the whole woad army. Do we know what happened with with his men? No, no. I mean, we know almost nothing about him from contemporary documents um, <laughs> that would be you know, from the fifth century or, you know, even a century or two later, that's as close as we can get. So uh, we can assume, though, that when 
Arthur passes away, certainly along the way, some of his men would have also been killed. But again, remember, they're not knights. They're warriors. Uh, He wouldn't even have been called king, probably, until Mm. maybe the end of his reign, if then. But earlier on, he would have been called either by a Roman title, uh, like a Dux Bellorum, a war leader, or he might have been called Comes, Count. And not early on would he have been called King Arthur. And so one thing the movie does get right is that if he's going to be called king, it wouldn't happen until very, very late in his life, if it ever happened at all. There is another Arthurian legend that I want to ask you about that we do see in the movie, although it's a it's a in a flashback, and that is the sword and the stone. There's a flashback. Arthur's childhood is his mom is killed by Merlin's people attacking their village, which is initially why he didn't like the woods. And but Arthur pulls the sword from the stone so he can go and kill Merlin to have revenge for his mother's death. Uh, then Merlin, in well present time as far as the movie is concerned, says, "Oh, it was." It was the love for his mother that let Arthur pull Excalibur from the stone, not hatred for Merlin. How well does the movie do showing the the story of the sword and the stone that has obviously tied to the legend? So if we if we go to the 15th century and Sir Thomas Mallory, which is my main area of study, what we learn then, and that's sort of where the, the stamp is put on this part of the legend, is that there is a sword in a stone and it appears by magic. And Merlin helps to set it up. And the stone's in an anvil that says, Who, whosoever shall pull at the sword from the stone is rightwise born king of all England. But that's not Excalibur. Hmm. Excalibur is a sword of Arthur's very, very early on as well, especially in early Welsh legends, but it comes from the Lady of the Lake. So it comes out of the water. So she emerges from the water with the sword for him, and he is considered worthy of the sword because she deems it so. So there are two swords, and later on they get conflated into one, that Excalibur is the sword in the stone. But the idea of a sword being pulled out of a stone, I have seen a documentary on Arthur. uh, I've seen several, actually, (laughs) historical Arthur. And one theory is that in early metalworking, you would use a stone mold and you would pour the metal into it to make a sword. And that perhaps the legend comes from it being stuck in this stone Mm. mold and someone of great strength pulling it out intact. So that could be the origin of the legend. But the magical sword Excalibur, it's called Caliburn or in Welsh, or Caliburnus, which means uh, cut steel. And that shows up early on. There's no mention of it being pulled out of a stone. If anything, it is gifted to Arthur by this mysterious fairy woman who has otherworldly power. And so that is how Arthur is sort of threading this needle between the real and the supernatural. And he has this sort of ordination that he is meant to rule because he's favored by people in the in the fairy world and he's also lauded and praised and held up to be a leader by real human beings. Okay. So yeah, the, again the movie kind of merging a lot of different things together. <laughs> well, what I would say is that if you were doing an Arthur movie, you better have a sword in the stone yeah. or the audience is going to rebel. Right. Uh and so I thought that making it the marker on the grave made a lot of sense that he is still withdrawing it from, you know, something that could be considered partially stone from the earth. So that made, that made a lot of sense to me, try and figure out how to represent this motif, this theme that is so important in the Arthurian legend. At the very end of the movie, there is a single ceremony where you know, every, everybody's happy. Merlin marries Arthur and Guinevere to, and they unite the people. And then, and that's when he is proclaimed to be King Arthur. Is there any truth to that sort of single marriage ceremony slash proclaiming the leader? No, that oh. is. <laughs> and in fact, that wasn't even supposed to be the original end of the movie. Oh, okay. That is an alternate <laughs> ending. Originally, the movie ended with the death of his knights, and it ended on a much more down note, which I think would be much more true to the legend. And I guess in test screenings, the audience said, 
well, this is not how we want this to end. And yeah. so uh, they did what movie makers have done in order to bump up the happy factor for their audience and close with a wedding and yeah. better yet, let's have it at a fake Stonehenge. Yeah. <laughs> right. So all of that, all of that is, is made up. I understand why it's there, but it is a, it's a bit over the top. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of like what we were talking about kind of throughout, you know, you have to have, you have to have Merlin in there. You have to have a sword in the stone. There's certain things. It's a King Arthur movie and people are going to expect it. So it sounds like you yeah, playing to, audience expectations for a lot of it. And I don't think you have any choice if you're going to make a successful Arthurian movie, un unless yeah. you choose to just go completely dark and historical and it wouldn't be a happy movie, I don't <laughs> think. Uh, and I don't know that anyone would want to go see it. It'd be more like an art film. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, rather than any sort of popular blockbuster film. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, I... Speaking of the film, I know we've talked mostly about the 2004 movie, but there have been so many movies and stories throughout history about King Arthur. What's something that most people kind of know the Arthurian legend? What, but what, would, what do you think would surprise most people when they find out about the real Arthur? Well, I can tell you what I tell my students every time I teach Arthurian literature. And what's fascinating is I ask them to tell me on the first day of class, and many of them have not encountered the Arthurian legend in any sort of systematic way. So they haven't read the early text. They maybe have seen a film or read a story. And so I asked them to tell me everything they know about the legend, and I write it all up on the board. And so they're telling me Merlin, and he's married to Guinevere, and Guinevere commits adultery with Lancelot. And Arthur has knights, and they sit at a round table, and they go on quests, including for the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he lives in a big stone castle called Camelot. And then I have to tell them it's the fifth century and Rome has left. So unless they're occupying Roman structures, no big stone castles, it's smoky little huts. Although <laughs> it's possible that, you know, Roman buildings that were left behind could have been reused, reoccupied. That's possible. We're not sure where Camelot was. As I've said earlier, there's no Merlin. There is a Guinevere, but there's also no Lancelot. The idea of the round table comes much later. The sword in the stone comes much later, although he does have a sword with a name like Excalibur from very early on. And the Holy Grail shows up in the 12th and 13th centuries. And that's another, it's actually a French writer who says, this is a great idea. Arthur's knights need to go on a quest. What's the best thing they could quest for? The Holy Grail. And so that wasn't part of the original legend either. And so I usually have a student yell from the back of the room, stop it, you're ruining it. <laughs> um, but then by the end of the semester, I think that they have learned to have a deeper appreciation for how and why the legend accreted to it all of these elements. Because I say the Arthurian legend is like a magnet. And mm -hmm. as time goes by, is there a hero over here who's fantastic? For example, Sir Tristan. Tristan had a long history as a legendary figure, all his own. Mm. But at some point, late in the Middle Ages, someone said, you know what would be great? Let's make him a knight of the round table. And then all of his adventures are connected to Arthur. And so he's brought in. Same with the Holy Grail. It becomes a quest for the knights. So the Arthurian legend is like a giant magnet that attracts to it all the cool stuff. <laughs> and make some great stories along yes. the way. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about King Arthur. I know you've written a lot. Um, one of your books, the King Arthur History and Legend, I'm a huge fan of that book. Um, before I let you go, can you kind of give an overview of the book as well as where listeners can find your work? So the King Arthur History or Legend is a series of lectures I did for the teaching company, which is now part of Wondrium. And you can get those lectures. There's 24 lectures. It's about the evolution of the Arthurian legend from its origins to the modern period. It's available in DVD. You can also download it online, or you can purchase the book that goes along that, with the lectures that gives some detail and bibliography. Um, so that's the easiest way to access that. My other books tend to be more for a scholarly academic audience. They have lots of footnotes. If you like footnotes, <laughs> great. But... One thing I have done is 
I translated Sir Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur into modern English because every time I taught that text, I was not happy with the translations that were available to me um, that I was sharing with my students. And I finally decided, well, I'll just do my own. And it's Mallory's text more than any other at the end of the 15th century that gives us the shape of the legend that sort of codifies it, puts the template down for everything that comes after. And so that's now available in a modern English translation. And my goal was to make it as accessible as possible so that people could enjoy the this huge book. It's a massive work that took years for Mallory to write. And in fact, it took me longer to translate it, I realized, than it took him to write it, which oh, wow. was a moment that when I hit that point, I realized, oh, well, I'm a little bummed out right now. But um, I'm really proud of it. And I think that it conveys the sense of the time and the culture while still maintaining accessible language that anyone can read. Fantastic. I'll make sure to add a link to that in the show notes for this episode. Thank you again so much for your time. It's my pleasure. I'm always happy to talk about King Arthur. Invite me back anytime. Next time a movie comes out, invite me back. Of course. Oh, there's so many movies. (laughs) Yeah. It was a pleasure chatting with you. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. I'd like to thank Professor Armstrong once again for sharing her knowledge about the true story behind King Arthur. And if you want to learn more about the true story, I would highly recommend go check out Professor Armstrong's lecture series called King Arthur, History and Legend. That's part of a bigger series for the great courses that she did. And as always, I've got a link to that in the show notes for this episode, as well as some more of Professor Armstrong's excellent work. But if you're driving or not able to get there right now, those links are always on the show's home on the web based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a quick refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, early legends place Excalibur as coming from the Lady of the Lake. Number two, Lancelot was always associated with Arthurian legend. Number three, some suggest Arthur married multiple women named Guinevere. Did you catch which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Early legends place Excalibur as coming from the Lady of the Lake. That is true. While there are legends of Arthur pulling a sword from a stone or an anvil, as Professor Armstrong pointed out, especially in early Welsh legends, the sword known as Excalibur came from the Lady of the Lake and was not pulled from a stone. Next up is number two. Lancelot was always associated with Arthurian legend. That's the lie. As we learned, the Lancelot figure wasn't formed until the 12th century. Professor Armstrong pointed out that a 5th century movie, like we talked about today, about Arthur, could have some characters from the legend, like Arthur, Guinevere, Bedivere, Kay, and Gawain, but no Lancelot, Galahad, no Bors, no Merlin, and so on. But of course, today, we wouldn't expect it to really be a King Arthur movie if it didn't have Lancelot or Merlin. So quite a dilemma for the filmmakers. (laughs) And that means number three is also true. Some suggest Arthur married multiple women named Guinevere. As Professor Armstrong explained, while a lot of the specifics are lost to detail, she mentioned that there have been some suggestions that it's possible he married more than one woman named Guinevere, which was a common name at the time as an early version of Jennifer. If you found today's episode entertaining, if you find value in what you're listening to, if you like what I do, you'd like to give back, you can do that over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.